Hello and welcome to your award-winning The Reasons I'm Broke podcast, bringing you the reasons we're broke every single week through news and headlines ranging from comics, movies, TV, video games, and more. I'm Daniel, and your other host this week is Matt. Welcome on, Matt. Hello, how's it going? Pretty good, pretty good. We've got uh, quite a bit to catch up on, especially industry news which is always fascinating, especially in a post-COVID world, just the way things are settling, especially with streaming and the strikes now. It is not a boring era at all. But first, if this is your first episode of the show, the way we format it is we go through this week's news, and then we head into the more personal side of the show, what Matt and I have been up to since you last heard us. So let's jump right in and explore sector number 576. So this one was pretty speculated as earlier when we covered this about a month back, one of the unnamed animators from across the Spider-Verse revealed that there is no way they were going to have a a movie done by next year. They said that they hadn't even started the movie. Well, now there's news from Sony, which indefinitely removed the sequel titled Spider-Man Beyond the Spider-Verse from its schedule and they cited ongoing strikes, which makes it impossible to meet the planned release date. Other Sony films, including Craven the Hunter, also faced delays. So what do you think, Matt? Is this a convenient way to sweep those problems that we're now learning about from that second film under the rug? Oh, oh, oh who could have seen this coming? <laughs> this was this was probably the, mo- the least surprising news. In fact, I'm surprised it took them this long. I feel like they waited until after, like, well, it's the the actor strike to make this <laughs> announcement. Like, first of all, anyone who's seen Across Spider Verse, don't get mad that it's be- that that it's delayed. Or they weren't the, the, either. They weren't that far along on it because Across Spider Verse is like the best animated movie that's ever been put to film. Ooh. It's so inventive and so and so great. I yeah, I will. I will die on that hill. It is the best animated film ever made, just from a sheer like the amount of you know different styles in there, the inventiveness, the how how quickly and fast pacing going, the how good the story is in there, the voice talent. Like it is, I and I will fight anyone on this. It's the best animated film ever ever made, and that was probably. And that's, and that's coming from like into the Spider Verse, which was already great. This this is on a whole other level of of uh, artistry. So take your time with Beyond the Spider Verse. I don't care if I have to wait another five years, but it's, it's just mind blowing. Just that they thought that like when they came at the end of the movie that like you know Miles will return in Beyond the Spider Verse in March 2024. Like we've already had two delays for this movie, which we thought. Was this going to be a sequel? And then during the promos leading up to it, oh, we're going to get two more movies. You know, it was going to be uh, Across Spider-Verse Part 1, then Across mm-hmm. Spider-Verse Part 2, and then it became Across and Beyond, which, fine. Like, uh, But it's it's trying to say that it has anything to do with the actors and writer strike is laughable, considering that, you know, the, the writing is well done before now. They may tweak some things during the production of it, but like, the writings for, with an animated feature largely is like has to be 99% locked, you know, for them to like be, to be, uh, committing talent to frames. And as far as like the, any acting talent, their voices have to be recorded before. There's some EDR that happens afterwards, but again, the writing and acting part of it, that's done before the animation is even going on because they have to have references for voices and mouth movement and, you know, things like that. So it's like, it's, it's not surprising at all that's, that it's delayed. I'm happy that it's delayed. Craving the Hunter, not surprised at all. I feel like they wanted to do another round of reshoots on that, on that movie. <laughs> Delaying it a year is not a sign of confidence. Well, Craving the Hunter, both of these films I'm excited for, Beyond the Spider Verse and Craving the Hunter. As, as I've said before, I really like what Sony does with the Marvel Universe. The one thing is obviously there, they were, The animators were talking about how the writers to Across the Spider-Verse and the directors were changing their minds on a lot of things and some of the writing. And there's even different cuts of the movie. 
And people were like, oh, that's clever. It's like a multiverse thing. And apparently it's not. It's literally different cuts of the movie that they kept mm-hmm. changing their mind on. And the animators were like, this is fucking stressful. Like, we can't meet these deadlines. And did any of that news where the animators were talking about how it was not an enjoyable experience working with the directors and writers this time around, did any of that start to sour a little bit your perception on part two and possibly part three, if they're going to be doing some of the same thing here. I mean, it puts a little bit of a bad taste in your mouth, but like anytime you have, you know, a, a, a passion, what for all intents and purposes looks like a passion project, you're going to have strong personalities. You're going to be, you know, putting strain on people. It's unfortunate to hear. And I wish that they, you know, that I, you know, it's, it's kind of like when you, you, yeah, have a celebrity or, you know, uh, there's someone famous that you, that you admire and you find out, you know, they're an asshole. Mm. It's like, you got to separate the art from the, you know, the artist and sometimes, but in this case, this is not separating the art from the artist. This is, this is the art and the artist are, are the same thing because those people, you know, some people, those people had to suffer. And unfortunately that's not, it's not a problem that's exclusive just to the entertainment industry. It happens a lot in like the electronics and software sectors mm-hmm. with programmers and coders working ridiculous hours Elon Musk took over Twitter now whatever the hell it is xmen.com <laughs> cool <laughs> um, and and you know they they're talking about coders who are like sleeping at their headquarters or doing like 1 a.m meetings and stuff like that and you know it's it's like you know labor is going is sliding backwards like you know the uh pandemic handed you know labor a little bit of a Pre where they started getting power and now, you know, to get better, better working conditions. And now, you know, things are, you know, going back to the way they were before and employers are reasserting, you know, their dominance and their, and their power. And unfortunately people got to pay the price now, as far as like the animators go, like, you know, we know their work was done, you know, work, you know, it took, takes place over the course of years. I know that the, um, uh, in the sequence that was, in the uh spider citadel that was that took that sequence alone took something like four and a half years to fully complete so obviously there's a lot of time that you know and effort that goes into that and it's it shows on on there what was i think it was like a hundred animators like quit uh, you know in that movie or but as far as i'm aware that's not unusual in the in for animated features for like a large pe- a number of people to what seems to be like a large number of people when you t- you're talking a hundred versus like a thousand or more that are actually working on the movie. So I want to say the ones who quit probably, you know, they did so for their own mental health. And like that shouldn't be, you know, looked down on or, you know, it's unfortunate. I, I think it happens a lot, like, a lot more in the industry than people want. And it's unfortunate and, and it needs to change. That's, I think like what a, like a couple of these, uh, or these two strikes that are ongoing are trying to get better conditions for some of these people. <laughs> um, and animators, not only what people behind the scenes, but also like the voice talent are the unsung heroes. They get a lot of uh, flack and not enough credit for what, you know, for what they do. Well, before we go into someone who quit right before season four, which may be affecting this particular show, I do need to know from Matt Stradamus, what do you predict the release date is going to be now for Beyond the Spider-Verse since Sony's calling it indefinite? So there's not even an estimate. So it's supposed to be March 2024. And they haven't started um, it, <laughs> according to and, this one animator. Well, yeah, we've got some pre-vis work, but I'm going to say it's going to be. I would be surprised surprised if if it's before March 2026. Oh, okay, I was I was thinking 2025, but 2026. That's probably a better guess if it's going to. It also depends, I guess, on how long this strike goes. If because I'm sure that's affecting some of it. Oh, right? I'm sure. You know, so that's 2026. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can see that. And and honestly, when it does come back, because Across the Spider Verse did well. It won't be a problem. I don't think it'll be like a situation where like Lego Batman or the Lego movie two, where they waited too long mm-hmm. from the first one and not enough people came back for it. So it's it's kind of unfortunate that that happened with the Lego films. But I think for this across the Spider-Verse, especially since it is a part two with Beyond, people need to know what happened to Miles. Yeah, they they left it on a serious cliffhanger. And again, they made a amazing amazing animated feature they had a great solid story great talent all around 
There's nothing, no other animated movie out there that looks or, or feels like it. It's a genre transforming animated movie. Let them take their time. You know, if, you know, I don't, I can, I know it could be frustrating, especially when you've got like Phil Lord and Chris Miller who behind the scenes, they're known for improvising and changing things up. And I'm sure that's very frustrating for those animators and that talent behind the scenes, but you can see all of that on the screen. Like it, it produced something that is going, that should be chased after. Well, that big quit that I was referencing earlier is Henry Cavill, my Superman and the third season of The Witcher, which just came out on Netflix last month, experienced a decline in viewership, which has sparked online debates. So in a recent interview with Polish news site Wyborska, apologies to Polish broquettes, the executive broquette Tomek Baginski pointed to American audiences and TikTok users stating, quote, Simplifications of plot points are necessary. A large part of them are Americans, end quote. So Baginski previously attributed season two's lower viewership to younger audiences' short attention span. The third season is now available on Netflix. So when I posted something similar like the Secret Invasion thing on Facebook, someone put out, put this great comment on there of that there seems to be this trend now of blaming the audience rather than taking accountability for your product or your project. And I think, and I haven't started Witcher season three, but from people that have seen it, they're talking about how different it is from the first two seasons and how they don't focus much on Henry Cavill even, and that it is low, the lowest quality of the three seasons so far. So I think maybe it's his job to point fingers at someone other than himself. And I get the temptation to do that. But I do see this as a lack of ownership on his end. Yeah, it is a lack of ownership. And when when did the first season come out? Like during the pandemic, like the world was like sitting at home, like not doing much. The world has gotten pretty much back to normal. I still have not seen season two of The Witcher. I love the first season, mm -hmm. uh, but my, my wife still hasn't seen it. So like I have put a pause on that until, you know, and so we get a hole in our schedule to basically rewatch for me to rewatch re the first season with her and then go back through there. But I mean, blaming it on American audiences, I think is, is a, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of a cheap hit. If you, if your product is not there, I mean, there's a reason why Henry Cavill did you know, decided to leave. And I don't think it has much to do with, you know, like there's rumors that or were reports that he's a huge Witcher fan of like the books, the games, like he's in deep in the lore, like he's a big nerd for it. And I respect that. And he did not like that the changes they were making from the material, like, yes, the changes have to be made to you know, adapt material. I think he is he, not unaware of that, but I feel like there were changes that were made that like he felt were against the, the type of the character and there's, so they also like before season three even came out, they already had already announced that Henry Cavill was not <laughs> returning for season four. So you are going to have a big contingent of people who are watching it for Henry Cavill. Mm -hmm. That why why am I going to watch season three if I just know he's not going to be? What's the what's the urgency if I know he's going to be replaced by one of the lesser Hemsworths? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was one of the things I had the, a bit of an opposite reaction when they did announce the season four is not going to have Henry Cavill. I was like, okay, so season three is the last season. I will watch season three. <laughs> you know, it was like, I, even though I know he's not going to come back for season four, I want to see his last performance as the Witcher. And for all intents and purposes, that's the last season to me. Cause I can't bring myself to watch it with someone else being recast. You know, they, I just can't do it for this character, especially that we were invested in. We watched Kelly and I watched seasons one and two. But it, yeah, blaming TikTok audiences and Americans, I mean, it's kind of bizarre because you he's surrounded, he works for Netflix, he's surrounded by all of these successful shows that are longer mm -hmm. than 10 seconds or whatever the limit is on TikTok or on Instagram, and they're widely successful and they're enjoyed. There's projects on there. Oppenheimer's three hours long and it did extremely well. The Barbie movie is about an hour and a half, I think, and that did extremely well. So I don't think that audience retention as far as how quickly they turn it off and go on their phone. People will tune in for something quality, no matter how long it is. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just the reality of it. Yeah. It's, it's going back again, that, that the audience just didn't get it is, I mean, it, it 
we've seen we've seen it before. Sometimes it's, it's a valid criticism. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it isn't. In this case, like there's a uh, the, the circumstances with which the first season of The Witcher became a cultural phenomenon have waned. Like there are certain things that were popular when around that time that that came out that like have since changed. Like this theatrical changed, home viewings changed. And, like it's yeah, it's only been a few you know like less more, like four years at most, but a lot has changed in that time. So, and Again, a lot of people are watching it for Henry Campbell. He, we know he's not going to go. So there's, as far as, or he, we know he's going. So like, for me, there's not really much of a rush. Well, we were talking about the actor strike and there's someone who spoke out possibly against it. And maybe there's a bit of backpedaling, but Stephen Amell, famous for his role in Arrow, recently spoke out against the ongoing SAG AFTRA actor strike. He expressed his stance at Riley's GalaxyCon, stating, quote, I support my union, I do, and I stand with them, but I do not support striking. I don't. I think that it is a reductive negotiating tactic, and I find the entire thing incredibly frustrating. I think that the thinking as it pertains to shows like this show that I'm on that premiered last night, I think it is myopic and I stand with my union, end quote. So despite his disagreement with striking, Amel emphasizes that he stands with the union on other matters. This definitely was a huge blowback for him because a lot of his peers and other actors and writers immediately were were cutting him off, basically, like discounting him. I saw the the voice of Wonder Woman on Twitter. She was she put up this animated series Arrow and Green Arrow from Justice League, and she's like, "Well, we know there's one good one." You know, she was putting <laughs> Susan Eisenberg she was putting <laughs> stuff like that up there. So it it was kind of. And now Amel's like, "Look, I'm just gonna take a step back from everything because it's a lot." And he he's definitely done that thing. So, what was your take on Stephen Amel against striking? It seems like striking's working. Honestly, it really is doing its thing. UPS was about to go on strike, and they ended up getting their thing resolved because of that. If you shut down the business, if you put it to a standstill, mm-hmm. they will start paying attention. I can understand his his frustration. Okay, and I'm not defending Stephen Amell. He's definitely he's put his, you know his own foot in his own mouth before. He's been a very fan friendly and social media friendly celebrity since you know the early days of the arrow he cultivated that's how he cultivated a lot of his following was being very open and transparent on you know uh facetimes and going live on you know from his trailer on the set of uh, arrow and i think he's continued that with uh his show heels um and i can sense his frustration with like he's got a new season of his show, like, which is definitely a passion project for him. I don't watch heels. I'm not very much into wrestling, but I know that, that Amel's a big fan of wrestling. And this has been something that, you know, a show that he's very passionate about. But, you know, you got the second season dropping and he can't go out and promote it. So I can understand the frustration at that point. In fact, I like, I was surprised he even did a con. Like I thought that, you know, the only celebrities weren't even supposed to be doing cons in during, you know, during the strike. But you know, he put his foot in his mouth and he and he owned it. But he kind of owned it in a in a way that he tri- you know he did have to walk it back. I'm sure some people talked to him and said like, "Hey, you know, you're gonna have to eat, you're gonna have to eat a little crow here." And I'm sure he's doing that. And there's been times where he you know, there's been it, it it's happened at least once or twice before where like he kind of like uh, spoke up a little bit too much and like on Twitter or whatever, and he uh, took a step back from there for a while. So. At least he knows that he made he made a mistake. Exactly. I think people will come around, and especially once this is all settled, I think emotions are a little high right now with everyone. People are with the workers are getting a little bit more desperate too. Uh, Iger, or I'm sorry, not Iger, but someone famously said who Ron Perlman went after, who he knows who said it, <laughs> that you know eventually these these strike these writers or, or actors are going to get desperate enough to where they'll be kicked out of their home and then that they'll wait it, wait it out until then. So some people might be at that point now. So they're going to be upset mm-hmm. at words like these. And, and I think other actors that might have this opinion or other writers, whatever industry workers will probably hopefully see that example and maybe, you know, keep their mouth shut for now. <laughs> and one of the key issues on this strike is the use of AI. So 
In July, of course, a little background, there were failed negotiations with producers, and a lot of this was also studios wanting to create AI background actors using real extras without their consent or compensation. So actress Alexandra Rubal Rubalcaba, who worked on WandaVision, revealed that she and others were scanned for digital replicas without knowing how they'll be used. So the fear is that AI will eventually replace background actors. And it, it is a little scary because it kind of reminds me of, it, it's not a great example, but for, but like when you work for one of the big two or, or even a big indie company in the world of comics where you kind of sign off your character, your, your baby away, right? Someone like Spider-Gwen or who was, who's the Red Lantern cat? Something star? Shit, I can't even remember. I know the cat. The cat you're talking about is it Dexstar? Was... I think it's Dexstar. De Dexstar, yes, Dexstar. Dex so his that the creator of that character was very adamant about them not using that character again. It was a personal story, and and it's it's a story of like, look, we're just this is just for this one off story, and DC's like, well, this is ours, so <laughs> you signed it off. I mean that that's the risk you take when you create something for the you know for a big publisher. Exactly. You can't go out. I mean, Alan Moore no, knows this very well, but mm -hmm. with, so it's kind of an example, a poor example of sort of you're signing over your likeness to when you're working on these projects and getting scanned for them to use your face and likeness in other ways and any way that they'd like. I'm hoping that the strike will settle some of that, but for me on the other side, non-actor, I think it is a little scary to, to sign off your likeness to some of these companies because, again, you don't know how they're going to use it, and they're not getting compensated for future use of these things. Do you? I'm sure in, in reading on this, researching on this, you've had to come across it. Maybe you haven't, but like, do you watch Black Mirror at all? I've only seen the the one episode with with the pig or whatever. <laughs> okay, so yeah, that was like in, I was like in the first the first season of yeah. it. So it recently came back with like a a new season with like I don't know. I, I mean, they like how they do it where they only have like like th like a handful of episodes for a new season. They'll wait until like they have more to do. So it's been years since there's been a new season of Black Mirror, but the most recent one that just came out recently, there was an episode called Terms and Conditions. With you know the central conceit of it was a show called Jane is Awful, which was on Streamberry, which was definitely Netflix. Even had the to dumb, you know, and it's <laughs> okay. Black Mirror is a Netflix production, so they were kind of making fun of themselves. But like, this is the plot of Jane is Awful. You know, it's basically someone who you know you sign up for this for a streaming service, you signed over rights to your likeness, and you're watching a show that is basically your entire life if it's like it's it's turning it's somehow at least through the use of ai they say it in the episode ai you know they're using what happens in your life to create content on the show and what you're we're actually seeing on the show is not really an actor it's you know it's ai generating a lifelike image and the person you're watching in the episode is not the actual person it's based on but you think it's that that person thinks it's based on them so it's it's very trippy very uh inception like or you know where it's or you know what you've got like like that illusion with like a mirror and you're in a room full of mirrors and it just seems like it goes on endlessly so it's that's kind of like what what's going on there i mean you've got whenever you have a movie with a, with a lot of special effects you've got like thousands of background actors we know that they don't actually have thousands of background actors there are you know, digital recreations, but those digital, you know, characters, they're make our digital characters. They're not, they're not scanned from, you know, people. So those people who are being scanned, you know, they're, they deserve compensation and to be rewarded for their work, you know, and if the likeness is being used, whether it's a background character or not, they should be compensated for, you know, for, for that work and for that uh, likeness. So. You know, the AI portion of it, yeah, it's definitely like there's a, the world's changing and uh, studios are always going to look for a way to, you know, mm -hmm. keep the money in house. Yeah. And the scary part about this, too, is hopefully there are some ground rules to pay people for that kind of stuff. Right. Of Right now, they're not being compensated, but hopefully something soon changes where, OK, if you're going to use their likeness, then you have to pay them. The problem that I see then, as you were mentioning, like studios are going to find ways around this. It's like, okay, well, aside from just banning AI straight up, which even if they did, I bet you studios would still find a way to use it. They would say, okay, take the likeness of, of you know, let's say Matt or Daniel 
and change it a little bit. Do like 25%, mix it up with Tom Cruise. And just to Mm -hmm. make an original, quote unquote, character that way, where it's not your likeness fully and it's not Cruise's fully. It's like a merge. And it's like, there, we got to, we, it's original. (laughs) You know, I'm afraid of that kind of stuff happening. Yeah. A lot of the, uh, SAG after and uh, like the writers and actors strike uh, and the regular stri- writers guild strike and a lot of it has to deal with with AI and unfortunately sad to say AI is here it's going to continuously evolve like a year ago no one was talking about AI like we're talking about it now like chat GPT mid journey a lot of this stuff has, is advancing by leaps and bounds in, in a way that like we that you know, the average person cannot keep up with. So all these things that they're trying to do to get their compensation and be fairly, fairly compensated for their work, AI, all, all it's is just temporarily holding back AI. Like AI is going to be used. It's going to, you know, be implemented in a way to, you know, cut costs to keep money and, you know, come in house. So it, it will not go, it will not go away like that. You know, that's, it's it's here it's here to stay, but if you're going to use someone's likeness, you've got to you've got to pay them. A lot of people that think you know that are are coming against the strikes are coming down on like the people who are millionaires who get paid twenty million dollars a movie or you know get a lot of recognition, a lot of uh, notoriety. Like thinking like oh they get they get paid enough. Like the strikes aren't about the Tom Cruises or the Robert Downey Juniors or the uh, you know, Killian Murphy's are not about those people. It's about, you know, that background person, the per, you know, the, the person who, you know, has one or two lines that may be the next, you know, uh, Kay Blanchett, you know, whoever, those are the people that the strike, the strikes about. And unfortunately it's just, it, it's, it's not going well. This is the longest strike that we've seen, you know, we've seen in, uh, you know, since I think the last time was, Almost ten years ago, about ten years ago, yeah, right around like, the hero. I, I, feel, I feel, I feel like this is going to go uh, a little bit. Like I don't, I don't see anything that says that this is going to end anytime soon. I think there's a there's a potential for this to go uh, into the fall, like well into the fall, if not the end of the year. Well, and we definitely will keep up with it right here on the show, and keeping it on Disney Plus news since. WandaVision was on there and some more accountability problems. Director Ali Salim had a quote about the critical and audience reception to Secret Invasion that's also been causing some controversy. So he dismissed mixed reviews, attributing them to the diverse preferences of Marvel's devoted base. Salim stated that he doesn't read reviews and questions whether it's their job to fulfill audience expectations. Critics then argued that if a project is presented as a certain type of Marvel series, it should deliver on that promise. So viewers saw Secret Invasion deviating from its Cold War-like premise, and that apparently left fans disappointed. I, I was not one who saw the show. Ultimately, the project's lack of consistency and coherence has led many to view it as one of Marvel's biggest misses. And his response is considered, Salim's response is considered inappropriate given the expectations associated with the MCU. So I I view this as a similar thing too with Netflix on, whereas, you know, he was, they were, they're both blaming the audiences for different reasons. Yeah. This guy needs to stop doing press. Just like the uh, showrunners of the Witcher need to stop (laughs) doing press. I'm, you know, listeners of the show will know that I, I do not come down negatively for the most part on uh, the MCU. Like I enjoy it. It tickles a part of me that I, you know, that I enjoy as far as I like seeing uh, what I, what I, what, for the most part, what they put up on the screen, I'll come out and say that it's the first Marvel, like MCU project disappointed me. Oh, really? Yeah. It's uh it's made a waste of Samuel Jackson. I feel we've seen storylines like movies that carry, um, the story, uh, the titles of iconic storylines that Marvel has put out in comics form, like Voltron, Winter Soldier, Civil War, all things that have the story ahead. The movie has been dra- has been very different from what was in the comics that they're adapting for. Right. This was probably the most different. I'm not. I won't go into all the details as how, it, but like there was a lot of for a show that was six episodes. 
It could have been cut in half. It could have, it should have been, it shouldn't have been a show that made Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. look like it was, you know, Tchaikovsky. <laughs> uh, it was, it was not, it, it was not, it was not good. There were change, there were, there were character changes are in there that negatively impact things that came before it. Um, not saying that they can't change, that it won't provide like fertile ground, in the, you know, in the future. But it was controversial from the get go with like the first episode. I'm watching the, op- I'm watching the show. I'm watching the credits or like the opening title crawl. And I'm like, was this made with AI? Right. And my, 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 my wife was saying this, you know, said the same thing. Like, yeah, <laughs> they used, they used AI, which was to make, to do the opening credits. Like, you know, they, and the director talked about that before, you know, about how, they wanted this kind of alien look to it. And I'm like, but, okay, there's alien look and there's something that definitely looks like it wasn't fully fleshed out. Like, Matt, that's just your like expectations. Was, <laughs> you yeah, got to work on your expectations. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I expected a quality product, not something that not, not a title screen that looked like it was made the weekend before the premiere. <laughs> it probably was. <laughs> um, it's, I don't, I didn't like where they went with like, as far as the like story, like story sense, like, they created a problem with creating a over way overpowered character that, you know, I don't know that we'll ever see again. And if we do, they're going to have to like, so find some way to depower them because they made someone who was more powerful than Cap Marvel. They wasted the concept of the super scroll, you know, and it's, it's, it could have been again, it's one of those things where it's, and we can talk about the flash later, but it's like where there were things that could have been good and, and better developed. But I know that, you know, from following the production that they changed and reshot like half of the show as they were like, you know, as it was in production. So I don't know what was the original storyline was or how much actually changed, but there was a lot of filler mm-hmm. when there didn't need to be. I mean, a lot of, there was a lot of fat in the show that could, that could have been cut. Like it didn't need to be a six episode series. I know there was some speculation that it was a film initially, and then they made it into a series could that have attributed to any of that, the reshoots that were coming out? Like it was supposed to be a Disney plus movie or is this for different reasons? I mean, the, anything I've heard about secret invasion is that it was supposed to be a series from the get go. Like it was never supposed to be a movie. Okay. Um, I feel like maybe they had to add stuff to flesh it out to six episodes. Like maybe they felt, felt that they only had like three episodes worth of material. Um, but it's, as far as like comparing it to like the, event series of the same name like it didn't hit it you know as, as far as like the other other movies that have borrowed names from other event series this was the most different and the most different in the wrong way you know like the biggest deal like the biggest like uh jaw dropper of the secret invasion series when that came out was when a scroll ship like lands on earth and you've got a bunch of legacy care like legacy characters coming out of that ship you know some of them who've been dead in the who've been dead in the comics like mockingbird that now you don't know like you see like a wolverine coming out of there you see mockingbird you know, a bunch of characters that like are these scrolls the people you know uh that you know we've been reading for years are the real people or is it the other way around? Like, are these characters that have been trapped in the scroll world for, you know, for years and now just made it back to earth. So there wasn't as there was, they did that with like one character in the series and the one character they did it with, they sh- probably shouldn't have done it with. <laughs> like they picked the wrong one to, <laughs> they, they, yeah, they pick absolutely the wrong one to do that with, but you know, it is what it is. Like, I can tell my, you know, my wife was not as invest, invested in it as I am. She, you know, she liked it, but it, you know, I think she, you know, she agrees that it's, it's not the strongest Marvel product that, you know, that came out. Um, as far as like, you know, like I said, I largely have been, you know, pleased for the most part. You know, I enjoy with well, the product that Marvel has been put it, you know, been putting out, but this is the first one. Like I Donald. I'd have to like, you have to twist my arm again to rewatch this one. <laughs> yeah. Tell me more about why you didn't <laughs> like this Disney MCU project. <laughs> you and Bobby are like the white knights of Marvel and Disney on this show. So it's like, I'm like, oh, just let him talk. <laughs> it's just, it was Going. just a waste of Samuel Jackson's talent. Yeah. Although he does seem to just do anything, doesn't he? Like snakes on a plane. You remember all that? Well, I mean, he's, <laughs> he's, he's very much like, you know, the, the, like him, like him, Tom Cruise, there's a select few people who were like 
A-list celebrities who basically just play a version of themselves on yep. screen. And this was like the most boring. I mean, this the version of Samuel Jackson that he that showed up on screen calling himself Nick Curie is what I imagine Samuel Jackson's probably like at home, like like very tired. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's see if there is more fallout. Obviously, we know they're cutting back on some of the Marvel and Star Wars shows. And for people who enjoy the that brand, then hopefully that means good things. Hopefully that means refining of the product. But we do have a little bit more here as She-Hulk star Tatiana Maslany joined picketers at a gathering organized by SAG AFTRA and the Writers Guild of America to address concerns about excessive corporate profits. So she advocated for better pay and working conditions and expressed solidarity with the industry veterans that are facing financial challenges. When asked about Disney CEO Bob Iger's remarks, Masley Maslani firmly disagreed, stating he was, quote, completely out of touch, end quote. And she also expressed support for visual effects workers' effort, efforts to unionize. So we talked about Iger's quotes a couple of weeks back and how. Basically, we're saying that things are are not going to get better uh, if the union doesn't shape up. I mean, he likes Zaslav. They're very much against the union. So do you agree that Iger is definitely out of touch when it comes to a lot of these things? It seems like since he took back over, it's almost like, well, he's not really that much better than Chapek. And from what I've heard from locals who work at the parks, they're like, yeah, he's not. <laughs> He definitely seems like it doesn't seem like it's the same Bob Iger that returned to the company, but at the same time, like, I think what's, I don't know if anyone's missed it, but like at the same time that he was, that he was it's like saying these things, he was also negotiating a contract extension with Disney. So he's now this, he, they brought him back for a two year contract that he was supposed to like, again, find a better, you know, mentee, like someone else to take him over. It was more in his line because he was known as a talent friendly ceo and you know when he came back i i i i mean it's not like i i i said this to a lot of people but i in the back of my mind I'm like there's no way he's coming back for just two years there's mm -hmm. no way he's coming back for just two years and he just signed a contract extension through 2026 okay so he he is going to be enough. I think I feel like that he's that he's saying things that are things that like shareholders want to hear. You know, things right. that are. I mean, it's possible that he is out of touch, and I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, he's someone who got to enjoy a little bit of retirement. Um, and he's and since he's come back to Disney, he's been shown to not be as um you know bulletproof as he, people thought he was. Like when he when he left and left it in uh, JPEG hands. But I mean, now that he's going to be with Disney for at least three more years, I think maybe things will change a little bit. But yeah, I do feel like his comments were a little bit of a little bit out of touch. And, uh, you know, if he says stuff, more stuff like that, he's not going to have, you know, a lot of product to be putting out for uh, people to be, you know, dumping money into their coffers with. A lot of bad PR <laughs> this <Yeah>. week. <laughs> yeah, a lot of bad. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a clinic in how not to do PR this week. Yeah, it's it's supposed to be more of you're supposed to toe the line, right? Just like, oh well, you know, we're all working to hopefully put this thing behind us, and that's it. Like, <laughs> it's almost it's almost like this strike is like wearing on people's nerves. Yep, almost. <laughs> Wait till next summer when there's like nothing to watch in the theaters. Oh, it's uh, yep, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna feel these effects for a while. That's for sure. Oh, Plus, yeah. terrible projects that are like, well, let's just do them anyway without the writers. I think uh, Deadpool three was doing that, wasn't weren't weren't they like as they were filming? Uh, I think they were until the until the actor strike hit. Yeah, well, we've got another Disney project here as Disney's Haunted Mansion movie bombed at the box office, earning a paltry twenty four million in spite of the massive budget. So the Hollywood actor strike further hurt the film's promotional efforts, leaving it overshadowed by competitors like Barbie and Oppenheimer. So Disney's overall box office performance this year has been disappointing with very few successes to boast about. Critics argue that deeper issues within the company need addressing despite CEO Robert Iger's attempts to downplay the problems. 
So we had, they, they were just coming off of Indiana Jones, which also underperformed. I mean, it's just yeah. more bad news for Disney. It's like Disney and Warner Brothers Discovery are both on the same track, <laughs> just downwards. Except that Warner Brothers put out Barbie. So at least they've got one feather in their cap for the summer. <laughs> well, like I was telling, <laughs> like I was saying last week, I'm like, oh, Maceo, they can make up two of those L's, two of those shitty movies that they released. <laughs> All that Barbie yeah. movie's going towards Bland Adam and... What was the other one? I guess the Flash, if you want to say, it kind of makes up for some of those, some of that loss. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's going to have to to make up for some of that. But yeah, uh, well, I mean, Barbie and Oppenheimer were the last two movies to like really get like any promotional push from the talent behind them. I mean, even with like you know, there's still like YouTube videos I'm always trying to watch with like te- the cast and the talent that were prom- you know, promoting the mo- those movies ahead of their release that are still showing up and like they're still milking it for what they can because no one's promoting those movies anymore. So no one could promote Haunted Mansion. It does have an effect. But also, like, please tell me whoever scheduled, you know, a movie like that in the middle of like a, in the middle of summer. Like, tell me, tell, tell me that they don't have a job anymore because how do you put that movie in the middle of summer when like, you put it in September, you know, September, October, when that really rightly should belong. <laughs> I bet you they have, there's some person somewhere with a chart that says, well, this movie we're releasing in October, we expect to do better. And I, I bet you there's data behind it, but yeah, that definitely didn't help things. And uh, I, I was initially like, yeah, you know, I want to see it because of Jared Leto, like he's in it and he plays one of the ghosts and, and I'm a fan of, of his acting. So I, I haven't seen it yet, but you know, I, I'm, I definitely want to check it out. And I, I couldn't tell you why, you know, this one, you know, did as underperformed as much as it did. I mean, I, I guess you can sort of point the finger at Barbie and Oppenheimer because families and older audiences are going to see those movies right now, but I don't know, maybe there just isn't, there's just not that wow factor with a project like Haunted Mansion. I don't know if it feels superficial audiences or if the actor's support really is that essential to the box office, but it could also just be, you know, the frustration that some consumers have towards the bigger studios like Disney or Warner Brothers Discovery that maybe they don't want to support certain projects. I really couldn't tell you. I'm not, I couldn't even begin to tell you why this one was as big of a flop as it was because I didn't, expect it to be a massive hit but it, it definitely i was like holy shit it really bombed <laughs> i think it definitely shouldn't have been released in the summer like it definitely should have been released in the fall but apart from that i i had interest in seeing it just because i thought the previous one with eddie murphy was kind of doofy uh, and, and i was i wasn't like a huge fan of it like it's it's kind of silly like i would never pay to see it but it, on the surface of it it didn't look different enough from that previous movie. And that movie came out, what, 15 years, 10, 15 years ago, Mm -hmm. at least. And you're, so it's, it's just, it wasn't, it didn't have enough of a, of a, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's like they were trying to coast on brand recognition alone and not really giving you enough to like pull you in. Like it was definitely like, it to me it should have been like probably a disney direct to disney plus release or like they definitely should have like maybe it was too late for them to change it because of agreements with exhibitors but like that definitely should have been like once the the actor strike happened like with the timing of it with not being able to have talent being able to promote it no talk shows going on you know no one doing anything of the of the sort like that should have definitely been pushed back i mean like i'm I would be surprised if, if like, uh, the Marvels, you know, actually comes out in November. Yeah. Yeah. I don't see that happening either. Yeah. You, you brought up a good point, brand recognition, because I'm, I'm thinking, all right, well, people like us who live in the central Florida area, we definitely know what Haunted Mansion is. We've most, you know, a lot of people in the central Florida area have been on that ride, literally. And it almost be like, oh, we're going to make a Dr. Doom's free fall. And I'd be like, oh, I know what that is, <laughs> you know, but everyone else, like, mm-hmm. I'm wondering how many people outside of California or Florida know the Haunted Mansion brand outside of like, oh, isn't that that Eddie Murphy movie? You know, I'd be curious to know yeah. if it's really that big of they've, a brand outside of here. They've had one movie made up based off of a ride that did phenomenal box office. And, and it was because it was allowed to be different. And like similar in like name only, and that was Pirates of the Caribbean. 
Oh, that's true. And, yeah. and that everything else they've tried, you know, duplicating, you know, since that has not has not had the success, even with their own subsequent pirate sequels. Like they were able to make one phenomenal movie, uh, you know, out of that. So, like, what they needed to do was like, okay, if we're gonna trade on the name, make something that is different from the actual attraction that will like the pirates movie series was so successful it caused them to change the ride in the park yeah to you know so do that with with haunted mansion like anything that i've seen in any of the promos like again you we're we're in florida we have access to the park i have an annual pass again so i've been on the ride like multiple times in the in the last couple of the last couple of months and like i've seen and watching these trailers i'm like Oh, that's an Easter egg. That's an Easter egg. That's an Easter egg. It's made that everything that they're using to promote it is an Easter egg for people who go to the parks, not for the people, not for the general audience that you need to you know, make money with. Yeah. Yeah. That could be it, man. That absolutely could be it. And the further I go from the release, I'm now like, maybe I'll catch it through someone's Disney plus. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, I'd like to go see it, but now I'm like, I don't know. Like I'm losing my excitement for it a bit I, again i like jared leto and scott who i knew he was gonna like the movie because he's a big disney guy and he loves the haunted mansion and sure enough mm -hmm. he was like i loved it it was great and jared leto was great and i'm like okay well that's great news like i'll i'll take the jared leto leto bit definitely believe him on that but i don't know maybe i'll check did you watch it yet did you see it no i'm gonna wait until it hits disney plus oh, um, there you go unfortunately like that like i would it probably wasn't gonna be a theater watch for me regardless just because like you know, we, I only have so much, so much time and mm -hmm. I still haven't seen, like, unfortunately, like at this point, probably gonna wait until streaming, but like, I still haven't even seen the new Mission Impossible movie, which I love that series. Again, talent promoting something doesn't necessarily get you to want to watch it, but it breathes the consciousness that something is coming out and something's out there. And I completely whiffed on like the opening weekend of Mission Impossible coming out. Like I forgot that it came out and it's been overshadowed by Barbie and Oppenheimer. Do you have Paramount Plus? Uh, I do. Okay, great. So yeah, yeah, that'll definitely be on there along with Oppenheimer. Yeah. You'll be able to catch up on a lot of these. Mm -hmm. So this last news story, <laughs> it was a, a fucking circus. I'll tell you that. So Rolling Stone, this is all pre the changes. Rolling Stone has hailed Zack Snyder's Justice League as the greatest superhero movie ever. That's how this news story read uh, at the beginning of this week. So they went on to say that the extended version improves upon the original delving into character backstories and presenting a formidable villain in Darkseid. The film's grandeur and dedication to its source material are also praised in this write-up. And it is, of course, a well-deserved recognition. You and I definitely agree on that with, with Rolling Stone. It is a well-deserved recognition for an epic superhero piece. But then, <laughs> hours later, they took down the tweets, the posts, and reposted the link to the article and rearranged some movies and instead moved the Snyder Cut from the number one position down to number 50 of 50. So initially it was believed that they had reversed, accidentally reversed the whole list. But when people, people have receipts, <laughs> they have the whole yeah. initial list. They and have they screenshots. Saw, exactly. And which they're now saying are bot made. They're like, oh, you Snyder cultists are faking screenshots. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the they, no, AI still has, still has problem with text. <laughs> so it, it wasn't that they were reversed. There were actually other movies that were in completely different positions. Like Black Panther, for example, wasn't, was it, like 30 something on the list initially. And then that one got moved up to number one. And, and so it, it was just a bizarre set of events because. We don't know what changed, if someone made a call, if it was a legitimate, somehow rearranged error, they all, oh, they all got mixed up, like this is the real order, or if someone at Warner Brothers or someone at Disney or someone at Rolling Stone got upset by the list, or they saw the fan reaction, we were praising it, you know, the, the movement was praising it, I made up a graphic for it, and I'm like, good on Rolling Stone, and I still released that graphic after the movement, because fuck Rolling Stone and whoever changed that, because I'm like, let's set the fucking narrative and and really, you know, remember what happened here. And and so, all of that huge fallout, right, people are, are saying that it's a fake list, and, and who cares, it's Rolling Stone, but... I'm more fascinated by the fact that they had to make a change and I want to know what prompted that. That's what makes it fascinating to me. Yeah, it is kind of 
pretty fascinating. I am rather curious myself. I believe that, you know, as, as we all know, the like best of lists are always subjective. Like they're different tastes, different, you know, climates, the, you know, things can change, you know, based on there's very few things that we can, that, that people can agree upon are like the best of the best of the best. You know, it's just really the only time you can kind you can kind of say that someone that some or something is the best of anything is, you know, the moment summer wins a gold medal at the Olympics. Like there's a brief shining moment where that person, you know, by one tenth of a second was the best of the best of the best. Mm -hmm. Anything outside of it, like, you know, the physical achievement, it's it's subjective. I'm going to preface what I'm about to say you know, with that. Do I do I think that Zack Snyder's Justice League is the number one best super, you know comic book based movie of all time? Honestly, I would have to go through the whole list because you know of comic book based movies because pre two thousand you know pre, actually you know pre pre twenty twenty you know twenty ten I would say you couldn't even come up with fifty best like right. half of that half of that list like I would say three quarters of that list would be very bad my my uh friends and i you know they when i uh you know still lived in upstate new york we would have like a wednesday night we would call we would have a uh, what we called c flash night that's an acronym for chinese food live action superhero night nice uh we would <laughs> like order it. like we would order chinese takeout we would watch whatever we could find that was live action superhero stuff you know good bad you know and just unspeakably uh, unspeakable Things you wouldn't believe existed. Uh, <laughs> like we saw a Aquaman pilot from like oh, the yeah. early eighties. <laughs> it's it's bad. Did we you watch the unreleased the, Fantastic Four. Yes, nice. We we watched the just the Just League pilot that C, that uh, <laughs> CBS made with David Ogden Steers and being a, a fla in a Martian Manhunter makeup and you know the. The Flash was like the dumbest member of the team, so it, it's just it, we've seen some really bad stuff. So again, it's been that's all to say that it's been an embarrassment of riches in the last years. Post two thousand, it's been an embarrassment of riches. There's just a lot of superhero of superhero content, not just in the TV front, but especially in the movie front. It's a time that I never thought I would live to see when I was younger because comic books were for nerds or for the people who were on the fringes and now we're the people who are basically running hollywood running entertainment well the bullies are now so, making money off of us <laughs> right, right. so do I, <laughs> so do i do i think Zack Snyder just league is the best of all time i think that's i think it's debatable i would say yeah. easily it's in the conversation for top 10 top 15 black panther do i think black panther was a great movie absolutely i think it was a culturally important movie but do I think that was the that's the best one? Definitely not. It's not even the best Marvel movie, but it's a very important movie just for representation. But I definitely would not say that you know, they're very much dumbfounded by how Zack Snyder's, you know, even if there was an, an error, how it goes from one to 50. Yeah. You know, if you, if you made a mistake, cool. Like I would expect, I would expect some changes, but to go from one to 50 and say, oops, it's reversed and it should be, a vet, uh, an actual reverse swap of what originally came out. And we know that's not the case. Exactly. It seemed like there was uh, an intention behind, like a pettiness to let's put it at fifty. Oh yeah, so, and that's exactly. And for some you can't give you can't you can't give Snyder fans a win. No, you can't. You you really can't. It, it, there is definitely some someone's intention, and I'm not putting it on just on Rolling Stone because we don't know all the information. But I right. think there was definitely something behind it. I, I do like that you bring up a lot of the subjectiveness and the importance of, for example, you were saying uh, Black Panther. You, you could almost say, like, even the Snyder Cut, for for me personally, it's not even my favorite Snyder film. Like, I would put Watchmen or Man of Steel above the Snyder Cut. But I would say that the Snyder Cut is probably, like you were saying, culturally important for Black Panther. I think Snyder Cut is important also, you know, for entertainment and you could even say for the culture of cinema because it's it's one of those rare things of like never came out oh, okay here's 70 million and now let's finish it and release it holy shit it's this big thing and and you've had yeah there's been other things like the downer cut and now they're trying to fight for the air cut or the schumacher cut but it's a it's a cultural phenomenon to the point where there's a joke in the barbie movie about it <laughs> you know that's how big yep. this thing is 
I, I laughed hysterically when I saw that. <laughs> I, I saw the joke on Twitter, and I'm like, I, I was saying it last week. I'm like, we roast ourselves better than this movie did. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when, 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 I, when I saw the joke, like I had to, I had to laugh because you, you got to just from the same, simple standpoint of like the movement was big enough that it became a joke in the Barbie movie. <laughs> and it's it's not like it's a it's like a movement or like a reference from something from ten years ago. It's like it referencing some it re- for something that's happening that's still happening right now. Exactly. Yeah. So you could almost make that argument for this film being at number one if you were to play up the importance of it, as far as films are concerned, not just superhero movies. Uh, it'd be yeah, you're right. It's it's a lot of that. No, I didn't see the, the whole list, but like how how many movies did Zack Snyder? How many of his movies did Zack Snyder have on that list? Because more most of his movies are comic book movies. Yeah, th- you know, like, Watchmen did, wasn't even on that list. Can you Watchmen, believe that? What? Yeah, th- that was not on that list on the that's top why, like, fifty. I get, that's why I get is, I, that, I mean, that's where I go to like where it's an embarrassment of movies, you know, embarrassment of riches, like that there's movies that actually have to be cut out of a top 50 list, but I can't believe that's not on there. What about 300? That'd be a, I don't know if they'd consider that superhero. That's, that's the problem. Like maybe if they put, Oh, was it, was it, was it superhero movies and not comic book movies? That's the headline. Yeah. Superhero movies. Now Scott okay. Pilgrim is on there on that list. Oh, so, they, well, that's not a superhero movie. It, it, yeah. So I, I think you could argue <laughs> that 300 should be on that list. Yeah. And and yeah, Watchmen isn't on there. Three hundred's not on there. I just did a Control F on it. Batman v Superman has to be on there, right? Nope. Batman v Superman's not on it's there. Got to be Man of Steel. Let's see. Man of Steel is not on there. So I think the only yeah, I think the only Snyder film on here might be the Snyder Cut. Honestly, like I'm trying to think. Let's see, would they put Sucker, Sucker Punch on here? No, they wouldn't. Okay, so that's not on there. I'm trying to think of any other superhero movies because they don't have Watchmen. Yeah, the Snyder Cut's the only movie they put on there. That's wild. They put Wonder Woman on there and people speculate that he That ghost- wouldn't have happened if it weren't for him. Yeah, and some speculate that he ghost directed some of that film and I don't know how true that is, but that is on there if you want to count that. <laughs> I don't yeah, I don't know how true that is either, but I will say that it shares a lot of its aesthetic with what he established in BVS and Man of Steel. Yeah, and especially when you look at Wonder Woman eighty four. Yeah, it, it's very different. It's like did the same person direct this? Like it's a, it's kind of weird. And I mm-hmm. understand that she fired like his entire uh, action crew, the stunt coordinators, and all that for this for that film. So that explains a lot of it. But yeah, I can't believe it. That's yeah, the only movie on here for huh. for Zach. Very interesting. <laughs> I mean, not that I would think that all of his superhero you know filmography would be on there, but it's wild that like that was the only one that made it on there, considering how many he's done. Megamind's on here. <laughs> Ghost Rider's on here. <laughs> Megamind? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my wait, God. Wait, 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 wait. Ghost Rider is on that list? Yeah, that's number 49. Up Jesus Christ. Tell Snyder me your night. Tell agenda where you got fucking Ghost Rider on that list. Yeah. Movie's terrible. <laughs> and they put Lego it's Batman awesome. way down at number 42. Now, see, I would put that on there because that movie was fucking brilliant. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> it was hilarious. I mean, it belongs on there, but like, I mean, even in a revised list, you're telling me that the Snyder Cut was behind that? Yeah. <laughs> well, before we go oh, into man. the broke up block, I do want to ask you, because I, I kind of already revealed my my two I th- two films that I think are, and, and I like all of Snyder's films, but that are better than the Snyder Cut, just his. What would you say your top three Zack Snyder films are, including things like non-superhero, like Legends of Gahul and all that? I haven't seen Legends of Google, so I can't make I can't make a, a commentary on that. But I think his best comic book based movie is uh, Watchmen. Mm-hmm. Um, I would put that I'd put that at number one. A lot of that, some of that has to do with the not only how faithful was the material, but like the one deviation, like the biggest deviation it had from the source material being like what wiped out, you know, the what caused like the everyone to come together at the end i found more believable than when i read the comic book when i read the comic book you know i had different expectations and the watchmen series on h on hbo mm-hmm. like that that limited series that played off of that better than i expected because that was more of a sequel to the comic book not to that wasn't a sequel at all to the, to uh what Zack snyder did but i think that from like coming off of like 300 
that like he raised his game to a whole other level. So I would say that that was his best one. I would probably put the Snyder Cut of Justice League as, a, as number two. And I would probably put BVS as number three only because his, I, I like, I like Man of Steel, but I, I still remember when I first saw that in theater coming out of that movie tired at not that I don't like action movies, but I came out of that feeling like I'd been battered over the head and a little depressed because of when Superman Returns came out with Brandon Routh. It did. It wasn't received well. Didn't perform as Warner Brothers wanted, and it was seen as well. You know, we didn't want the traditional Superman. Zack Snyder's you know version in Man of Steel was a response to that. It gave us you know what basically what people said they wanted, um, and a reimagined Man of you know this you know, Man of Steel in a post nine eleven world. That's right. And what I didn't like about it has nothing to do with what Zack Snyder put on the screen. It, it had to do with well, you know, this actually like accurately reflects what Superman would be. What, you know, what if he were to premiere would be a real thing in the world today? I felt like this was pretty accurate and it depressed me. Like this is the state of the world that, you know, so that you have this power for any creature and people, it would, it would come down like a nuclear, excuse me, like a nuclear event, like, like Oppenheimer, like the bomb in Nagasaki. And Hiroshima, it, it was just like it would it, it would come across as a very bad event, and I like BVS for how it responded to that. It gave us the most accurate version of Batman we've actually seen on screens for you know t- accurate translation to the, from the comics, both physically and you know mentally. It gave us a good version of like the the uh, Dark Knight, Dark Knight Returns version. We didn't have to go through an origin. It had a had a fairly accurate costume, and it gave us a Batman who had hope by the end. And if, if that's where it became clear, or yeah, you know, like the vision was that you know Zack Snyder was like moving towards giving us the Superman that you know like we were that traditionally we're used to, like the more hopeful, more optimistic, brighter, like even the color saturation saturation of, of his costume for a Man of Steel to BVS was brightened so like it was something by the end of like justice league you know whatever he was doing that we were going to get that like the end of that was getting the superman that you know we're traditionally used to but we basically told people with uh children studios with uh superman returns we didn't want yeah exactly right yeah and even in bvs itself that's kind of the nice thing about that movie on the rewatch because you kind of notice that the setup for Superman as being that hopeful character is already in the movie where he is betrayed by his own people, by Earth, who yep. he considers his home. And and con- like to the point where he says, you know, nothing stays good in this world. And I know a lot of people had a problem with that, but it's like, keep watching the fucking movie. <laughs> and then you see that he chooses to protect the same people in spite of everything they've done to him, in spite of this Batman that they've thrown at him. And he still to, sacrifices you, you, you want to see how prophetic that line is. Nothing stays good in this world, but just related back to like real world, you know, uh, events, the hearings where they're talking about, like there's, you know, the military has been hiding evidence of UFO activity and there's, they have, you know, all, all this alien shit that the government's been hiding. And, no one, no one cares. <laughs> everyone's, <laughs> everyone's so apathetic because nothing's good anymore at this point. <laughs> give us our alien overlords because it's got to be better than the people who are running the show right now. <laughs> or they don't even believe them now. You know what I mean? Like- I mean, it's like, I think, I, I think everything's just so, everyone's just so apathetic now. Like personally, if they were, to, if like an alien mothership were to come down and say, we're blowing up everything, I'd probably say, you know what? We had a good run, but we, we honestly, <laughs> You know, we, we, we don't have a leg. We don't have as a, as a, as a culture, we don't have a much of a leg to stand on individually. <laughs> maybe <laughs> it's like, can you wait until justice league two comes out, please? Right. <laughs> and three, <laughs> 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 then do what you want. It's, it's kind of like the James Gunn thing. It's like, yeah, reboot it all you want, but just give us these two movies, please. <laughs> well, there you go. That is our news for this week. Let's head into the final portion of today's episode. The bro kept block. What Matt and I have been up to since you last heard us. 
So Matt, please kick it off. What's been going on with you? What have you been playing, reading, and or watching? What's been making you broke? Oh, so many things, so many things. The last we talked uh, was just before my wife's brother and his wife were were visiting from China. They've since gone. They went to their, uh, you see their friends in the, up in Virginia. And now they're actually, the time we're recording this, they're uh, in Germany on their way back to, to, uh, to where they live in China. So while they were here, it was great to finally, like, finally meet in person, my brother-in-law. And um, we got, we, you know, we, we went to Disney that made us broke enough. We went to a bunch of escape rooms. Uh, there was one in uh, Sydney called Dare to Escape that uh, we, we, they went by themselves. I had to work one day. We went back to do a different room another day that was like an old video store. And it was like, I wanted to live in that room. It was like walking around, in, you know, Friday night at Blockbuster. Like it was a very, very fun escape room. As far as like what we're watching, Jesus, we're, we're trying to re- uh, make our way back through uh, Good Omens because the new season of that just came out on Amazon. And I'm re- also rewatching uh, Invincible because the new season of that's coming out soon. And it's got a bad taste in my mouth, as I'm about to say it, but I watched The Flash. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's oh. save that for the post jingle talk because I'm, I'm sure I've okay. got a question I'll, to ask you. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. Just this. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about it later. But, uh, I watched Barbie and like Barbie uh, was fantastic. It was like amazing. I had uh, my friends and I, we, we saw that it was, we had like the best time, you know, as a group, just like watching that movie. Uh, it was hilarious. It was just, it was subversive in the way I wanted it to be subversive. You know, they, they weren't off by saying like, if you like Barbie, you like this movie for you. If you don't like Barbie, this movie's still for you. Hmm. If, if, if you have questions about seeing Barbie, like then you're probably, or if you're not sure, you think it's just for kids. Definitely, this was not made for kids. It was definitely made for adults and people who forgot how to be a kid at heart. It's def, it's, it's better than you, than you think. It was utterly fantastic. We saw across Spider Verse again. We're glad that's out in digital. Oh really? Um, What's uh, you rented it, or is it on a streaming service? I think it's, I think it's coming out on digital soon. Like I okay. just read, so, yeah. but we we uh, we we saw it in the theater a second time. So much stuff. Like I've I've, I've so much stuff. Like I'm losing track of like what what we're actually watching. Like we watched Secret Invasion. Unfortunately, that was like six weeks. Like a you know uh, waiting for it. That is just like it was just. Uh, I'm glad it's. I'm glad that's over. I am looking forward to Loki season two, which is coming up soon. And then we just started watching, or about halfway through the, was it the first season or the second season of the After Party on uh, Apple Apple Plus is out, or the the first half of the season though. Like so I think there were like five five episodes in, so we enjoyed that. I don't know if you watched uh, at all any of the first season, but the premise is that you know there's a murder that happens, you know, in the first like the opening seconds of the of of it, and then. At an after party in the first season, it was uh, the after party of uh, a high school reunion, and the person that's killed, they're basically you know invest- the detective comes along and investigates, and and the person that they're interviewing tells their side of the story or how you know, the of the events of the evening that led them to where they're at, and each episode's like a, like a different style. Like you've got one that's one episode that's like mostly animated, one that's like a ro- like a romance, one that's like an action movie. So everyone, every it's kind of like ro- uh, the movie Rashomon on crack. And then so like the second season of that is out, and it's even more heightened from the you know from the first one. But that's fun. And then we're looking forward to Only Murders in the Building season three coming out. You know, comes out soon. And you've done like a. Uh... What I would normally watch in a year <laughs> since you were last on, like you've accomplished quite a bit there. <laughs> the, the last, the last month has just been a whirlwind. It sounds like it. Yeah. And when you were last on, you were talking about how there were, yeah, there were these, you know, you had your relatives coming up and all these events coming up that it's like came out on the other side with stories. <laughs> yeah. And it sounds like you had fun. <laughs> I'm sure I am sure I am forgetting a ton of stuff, but this is not the Matt show. This is. <laughs> the reasons I'm no, broke. no, no, no. When you're on, it's the match show, man. <laughs> and next week it'll be it, it'll be the the Julian show, and then hopefully the Bobby or Sam show. So yeah, that's how I, I like it, man. I like how playing it that way because <laughs> I'm on every week. <laughs> 
So yeah, and and that being said, you know, I haven't been watching a lot. I've done I've dug into season two of Succession, but I think I'm at that point again where I'm like, I think I'm gonna drop this for now and work on something else. It's like something that I kind of give up on a little bit and then come back to. It's like a it's almost like a lesser House of Cards a little bit is what that reminds me of. Where at least House of Cards had Underwood, who was to me like an enjoyable character, like not a good character, not a good person, but an enjoyable and entertaining character to watch. Mm -hmm. And then succession is kind of missing that, you know, it it does have one of the Macaulay Culkin brothers in there. Who's the comedic part of it. And you know, that's all right. But otherwise I don't have someone that I really connect with on that show yet. And I'm already in season two. So I'm kind of like, you know, uh, do I really want to invest more time into this? So I might jump into something else, but I've otherwise been, you know, Leo briefly talked about it, but when he was, cameo (laughs) jumping in on this but yeah we have been making progress on his jurassic world or jurassic park evolution game which is basically dinosaur tycoon or zoo tycoon from back in the day but that's cute but it's all themed you know it's merchandise to jurassic park or Mm -hmm. whatever and and the games the game isn't kind man you can't you can't unlock the dinos until you beat a certain park or island on four stars which alone is like three days worth of work and then you can unlock the dinos in sandbox mode, which is something that a lot of people that played the game were very upset about because they're like every other roller coaster tycoon or any other planet coaster games, these t- type of sandbox games, you get everything unlocked or at least most of it in sandbox mode. This game is unforgiving. They're like, here's four dinos. If you want the rest, you better play the campaign. It's like, dude, come on, at least charge me fucking money. Like I'll, I'll pay 10 bucks to unlock everything. <laughs> and it's like, no, no asshole, play the game. So being that I'm Leo's dad, I'm like, well, I got to get him his T-Rex. So I'm, I'm working <laughs> on that. <laughs> but he seems happy. He's like, oh, I like the, the compies. And he's making little pens for them and all that stuff. And I'm like, all right, for now. What's his favorite dinosaur? Do. It's that T-Rex. It's yeah. the T-Rex. <laughs> yeah. So I got to get it. Got to get him that T-Rex. <laughs> and you don't unlock it until halfway through the game. So we're at least two months away. <laughs> at the rate we're going. <laughs> But Matt, it's been a lot of fun as always to have you on and discuss a lot of industry this week. It definitely landed on a good week with you on. So I want to thank you for helping host this week and please let them know where they can find you. Uh, you can find me on uh, Instagram, uh, at her.com spelled out.com or on Facebook at, you know, facebook.com slash Madner. Now, actually it's funny. Like I've got one of my, my one of my 3d printers going as we speak. So we're now that we our our guests are gone, our rooms cleared up. I'm starting to, uh, you know, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be pump, pumping some stuff out. So like maybe maybe you'll be we'll be next time I'm on we'll be uh, talking about prints on TikTok. We'll see. <laughs> nice, yeah. Hopefully you get that going. I know you had briefly touched on that before. And ha- have you started going into like D and D figures or anything like that? Any personal items? Not yet. I'm more just kind of like got getting my. Uh, putting my printers through, the, through their paces at the moment, just kind of like just print up some stuff that looks like people are buying or selling at markets and stuff mm. like that. Trying to track, you know, f- narrow down who has like, you know, a good number of files. A lot of these, the bigger, like three printers, like they reference a lot of people who have like Patreons that, you know, they have subscriptions to their like monthly subscriptions to their files and so it's just trying to figure out not only who has like a good variety of them, but also a variety quality and stuff that you see people kind of selling because there is a wide market on there. People, you know, I, I know there'll be some people like you know rolling their eyes at like three D printers, but like there's a big market out there. You know, you can only print so many. Like you, you basically have to uh, have like a multitude of printers, basically, for them to be a uh, something that you, you could you could uh, support your family on. Uh, but we're just, we're just, uh, my, my wife and I just kind of like want to, you know, print some stuff up and go to like local markets at to like, uh, you know, a lot of like the local breweries in Florida, like we'll have like, you know, weekend markets sometimes. And mm-hmm. we kind of want to just like go and do that, like sell, sell some stuff and, you know, drink some beer. And, you know, if we make some side money, as long as we make like, you know, what it costs to like go there and do it, then I think we're kind of happy with, with, with that if we start out with that. So. Hopefully we'll be listing some stuff, some, uh, some stuff soon. And, uh, you know, maybe, you know, this time next year we'll be looking at, uh, 
you know, doing some markets. So we'll see. Yeah, I was just going to say, if all go, if all continues well, then you'll end up at MegaCon again. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I know the, I know the next MegaCon, we're de- we're definitely like going as a uh, guest. We are we already bought our uh, our passes nice. like after last after this most recent MegaCon because they were com- it was coming up in February, but like we'll see maybe you know the year after that. Yeah, very good. I'm looking forward to hopefully one day going to MegaCon again. Kelly and I talked about that San Diego Comic-Con cruise because the prices aren't bad. Like, honestly, they're like regular cruise prices and you get Comic-Con on the cruise. I'm like, shit, Kelly, we should do that. So we might so do we, that next year. We did we did look at that and we and we were initially like on on board for that. And when we saw the prices, mm-hmm. um, it was because it's on like the ship that it's being held on is this ship that my uh, wife and I went on our De- uh, delayed honeymoon cruise back in may um yeah. so like we're familiar with you know we're familiar with the ship but the prices that they're that they're charging were were not 100 sold on it because we definitely had a or we had a ocean view room for less money than what they're charging for you know for an entire week than what they're charging for an interior room on for a, a four-day cruise gotcha so compared so, to you're saying you can get more if you go on a non Comic Con cruise. Yeah, if you if you go on like a standard cruise, you can probably get more. Obviously, I feel like you know they're paying for talent. In, sure. in the you know to be on to be on that ship. I don't think we hundred percent made up our mind, but like we're very very tempted about going on you know going to that cruise. Yeah, let me know. Maybe we can link up at some point and. And it'd be kind of neat to see, like, obviously there's going to be some celebs that are like, fuck this, I'm staying in my room the whole time. But, you know, I've heard of like other celebrity cruises where they will go out and about and mingle with the people. Like the Impractical Jokers cruise, for example, they do that. Mm -hmm. So that'd be cool to just, (laughs) you know. It would would be fun, especially, you know, knowing that it's on a ship that that we're familiar with. So it's like we already know like how to get around on that ship avoiding the most the most number of people possible <laughs> <laughs> that's where you'll find them <laughs> yeah yeah there's palmiati there's connor <laughs> mm-hmm. awesome well this week if you want to be heard on the show go ahead and leave us a voicemail there's a link in the description but otherwise it is speakpipe.com slash the reasons i'm broke 90 seconds or less send in your question or comment and you can be heard right here on the show Thank you so much for joining us this week. I've been Daniel, joined by Matt and Brokehead Core. All will be well. All right, so I got to hear your thoughts on The Flash because I know that you were very excited about Michael Keaton being on there, and let, let's hear it. I've heard a couple thoughts already from some of the Brocat Core members oh and hosts, god. but oh my god, bro! Uh, I don't even know where to start on that. So, like, my initial rating coming out of that with like I I went to see it with uh, a friend of mine, friend and, for, and former roommate, boyfriend to like one of my one of my best friends, and uh, he's a huge Batman fan, huge, and like he we would constantly like you know, measure each other's dicks for whoever is uh, the biggest, the bigger Batman fan. Nice. <laughs> uh, um, you know, not to get like blue or anything like that, but you know, we're already there. So, but we also had free, but we, what we, neither of us like wanted to pay to actually go see, you know, see the flash backtracking when guardians of the galaxy three came out, the theater we went to had like a scheduling thing. And a lot of people bought tickets for like a screening that actually like was a glitch in the system. Mm. So they ended up giving a lot of people like the, we had the, the screen we ended up going in ended up being oversold people like basically sitting on top of each other. They had to like, they had a big old mess on their hands. So they gave out like a bunch of, you know, free tickets to people for future movies. So we bit, we used that to go see this movie. And I know that, you know, Andy Muschietti, the director has said a lot, has, you know, said a lot in the press about how like certain effects were supposed to be certain way <laughs> and whatever. And, you know, it's supposed to, and it's stylization. I'm like, no, 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 there's stylization in which there's something that looks intentional. And then there's stylization in, way in which something looks unfinished. Right. This looked unfinished. Like how does a movie that had a whole other year that got pushed back? It looks like it was entirely because of like that the controversy around you know Ezra Miller 
and that they did no work on the movie in that uh, and no additional work on that movie in the year since they just let it sit on that shelf and not take the opportunity to finish any more effects or if they did take more time to do more you know, to, to do more work on the effects this is what we got mm-hmm. so like i anything that i'd seen online was like you know like for off of a cell phone or you know unfinished work so like i couldn't really like judge it for what i until i like i saw what was actually going on in the movie and bro this was so disappointing like my initial rating coming out of that movie was an optimistic like six six and a half which to me is like the worst rating i can give something because it's it's that means it's, it was just it's just meh like if i can give something a one like i can enjoy for how terrible that movie was and i can and i can rattle off with glee like how bad that movie was I see what like, you're saying, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you've got your movies that are there you know they're it's not it, it, it wasn't so good it was great it wasn't so bad it was terrible it was just like there were so many missed opportunities and you could see like there was the bones of a good you know of, of a good movie there like there were good there were positives to take away from it discounting the controversy Ezra Miller's performance was good Michael Keaton's performance was good Sasha Kaye as Supergirl I want to see more of her they need to tweak the costume a little bit but like she was excellent but it, it it's far far outweighed by the negative in there like the special effects in a lot of parts didn't look good the you know appearance of like nicholas cage like how like how do you how do you have nicholas cage who, who wanted you know who got paid 20 million dollars to you know not be superman and you can't even get him on film for 30 seconds you had to make a cgi nicholas cage right He's in the, that man's been. I don't know if you if you know about there if I've mentioned it before, but like he got paid twenty million dollars to ultimately never play Superman. Mm-hmm. He had a pay or play contract, and it, and and what we saw on the screen was like the biggest joke that Kevin Smith constantly talks about. A big spider. You know, it, it, you know, like yeah, like the the thing that he didn't want was in that movie that he was forced to put in the script is what showed up on screen. I, I know is is point of view on it is different now because it's like a cultural thing and you know made it in the movie it's 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 a little bit different than the one he was originally talking about it but like the thing he didn't want in the movie is what showed up on the screen uh (laughs) you had a bad cgi recreation of christopher reeve um you had i can see what uh michael shannon was saying about zod that zod was just there he wasn't there to be a character he was there to be you know a you know something uh, uh, to be a challenge but he wasn't like a, pl- a plot point of the movie he was a he was a plot device yeah and people uh, kept shitting on him because of that and they're like oh this guy thinks he's the star it's like that's not what he's fucking saying no like, he was there to be a character he wa- yeah exactly watch man of steel like that's a character there's ambition yeah. behind it there's reasons you could almost agree with him in certain ways like Jorel does and he's like i i'm gonna honor the man you were like they were friends there was a history there but I didn't see the flash, so I don't know like how flat the vil- is. The villain of the movie was something that they already did like two, three years ago. Like I think it actually was I think it was the, the villain of the third or fourth season of the Flash TV show. It's like they've done like the, the, the ultimate villain was Barry, you know, a version of Barry that you know that create that uh like I'm I don't I'm really not spoiling any, anything. It's been out long enough. It's out there for mm. streaming. So the ultimate villain was, you know, when Barry you know, breaks time, like goes into this alternate universe, he gets powers to the alternate, this alternate timelines version of himself, who is younger and inexperienced. You know, that guy gets powers and that's the one who he keeps, he keeps changing the timeline. Like they eventually like, they fight Zod everyone's like batman dies supergirl dies they're losing the, they're losing the fight so they go change they try you know going back in time to change it again and the newer barry from you know from this universe he keeps trying to do it again and again and again and again and so like the villain of the movie actually was this alternate barry like you saw in the beginning of the movie when he first got knocked into this timeline this barry is you know, someone who's done it like a million or more times. Like he's been doing it. Like he's, he's an old man. That's what they did in like the third, fourth, third or fourth season of the flash. Like the villain is Barry, and it was done way worse than they did it on uh, the TV show. So it was also, it was a recycle, it was a recycled plot 
unfinished effects. We all we know that the original plan for Michael Heaton's Batman was that he was somehow going to survive all this or come out of this. And Barry right. would come back and he would uh, to the you know regular world. Batman would be older and he would serve as like you know Ben Affleck's Batman would be gone and this new mm-hmm. and Michael Heaton's Batman would be back to be serving as like the Nick Fury of the of the DCEU. And we know that's been changed and they keep playing with and uh i know, I know everyone like a lot of the broquette's feelings about uh james gunn i like it I, for the most part i like his work but now i can't you know when he i heard him on michael rosenbaum's podcast and like people who weren't affiliated with this movie saying like how that it was a, a you know a good movie and you know, like it was you know special and whatever like now like obviously james gunn ceo of dc films or co-ceo He's selling a movie at this at this point. Like he definitely, he called know, it the best superhero film he's ever seen. It's not even close. Like you made a if you made a list of like a Rolling Stone made a list of the top fifth or the bottom fifty movies, this would definitely be in contention for number one. Well, and the uh, whole, my just whole most disappointing. The whole point. My whole point is like there's advocating for a movie, and then there's calling it the best fucking movie you've ever seen. <laughs> like yeah, a lot of no. people were like immediately are like whoa if this is what he thinks is the best <laughs> no it's 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 bad like so like i loved peacemaker i liked his the suicide squad so like i'm not down on his work and i liked his guardians of the galaxy movies like you know you can say what you want you know a lot about him but like i'll pay more attention to his to his work i'll let his work do the like what shows up on film i'll let that do the talking and i'm not gonna listen to him as much when he's promoting something because like i understand that he at this point that he had that he has a vested interest in saying nothing but glowing things about anything that comes out of dc because they knew that they were going to be losing money on this and he's got to you know basically toe the line of like we need to promote this as positively as we can to get people to see, you know to see it like and it's wild it's wild that like they that they're losing more money having released that movie than if they just you know, lock if that if they just locked in the vault like they did with the background movie. Yeah, it, it underperformed even more than I thought. Like I was like, this shit's gonna flop. There was like a, a day where I doubted it because I'm like, enough Snyder people are being fooled into this. I'm like, come on, guys. Like, are you new here? <laughs> like, and then they were like, Well, I want to see Ben. Like, people that I've had on the show were like, I well, I just want to see Ben's last performance. I'm like, you want to see Ben's Justice League return? Because that's what that is. <laughs> you can well, see it in well, the trailer. And what, well, it's wild. Like, there's a line in the movie that is, that I, I don't remember what the line is, but I, I tried to remember because I wanted to, wanted to say what it was, but like, it was, there's a line in that opening that is definitely like something that directly references something that happened in the Snyder cut, not the Justice League cut. Sure. Yeah. He talks uh, so, about, uh, the, the Russian. Yeah. I, I know what you're talking about. Like, they, they yeah, they, they, re- like, he refer- references like the time travel thing. Exactly. That, that Barry did in the cider cut. So it was like, yeah, that's, that's, that's what it was. So like they were very much trying to like play on that. But like if they were trying to like relaunch the DC, it, it, all of like what they're trying to do with the movies smacks so much of like when DC did the new 52 and it were, there was so much confusion and like what was canon and what was not. Like, well, if you're saying this is canon, but this isn't. That mm-hmm. doesn't make sense with where this character is, and like, how does Batman, who is now, you know, new, you know, like in this new Fifty Two, like, how does he have a ten year old son, you know, or a thirteen year old son with Damien? Like, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. If he's only been Batman for a year or two, how does he have, like, why does Rajal, Raza, why did Rajal Gould care like thirteen years ago about stealing, you know, stealing his seed to make a kid? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it was, that's a lot like what where this movie ended up with where it's like okay we have Ezra Miller still there like again his performance was good but like you're crazy if you think that there he's ever going to play the flash again like uh right you, you're going to recast him you bring back Jason Momoa's Aquaman in a pro in a pros credit scene and it's not entirely clear and there's some wiggle room whether he actually remembers any like he actually like had anything like there was a justice league like or it's just someone that barry found like trying to re- bring everyone back together it's not exactly clear you're in a reality supposedly where now like george clooney's batman batman is the batman that survives because like and this and this 
George Clooney Batman recognizes Barry. Like he called him right. and he knows him at the end of at the end of this at the end of this movie. So like so which version of Bat it's not even clear like which version of Batman is because now you've got to have you're gonna have the brave and the bold, which is gonna have a completely different Batman. So it's like at this point, if you're already recasting Superman and Lois Lane and you're bringing in you know legacy characters and you know, you're leaving. You're trying to leave some wiggle room whether blue, the Blue Beetle movie is actually going to be in the DC, in the new DCU or not. I think it's going to be it's going to be entirely on how that movie performs. Of course, <laughs> uh, it's if it if it tanks and is or it, or is not well received, you know, by you know cr- you know critically, it will be ignored. It, um, yep. I think it's important. I think it's important to have you know diversity, and I I want to go go see that, or I I, I want to see it, but at this point. I've had enough of, I want things to, you know, DC things to be good. And I'm just, I'm just tired, man. I'm just tired. Flash was terrible. Black Adam was terrible. I just finally saw uh, Shazam 2. And n- not terrible, but also not good. If it had come out like a couple years after the first one, it probably would w- would have been better received. But it was weirdly aimed more at kids than the first movie was when they were younger. Huh. <laughs> Yeah. But it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't terrible. But, you know, as, uh, as every Levi was also doing the, uh, blaming the audience kind of thing for how well that, yep. or how that, uh, that underperformed. But I thought it was a good, like, family movie. It was definitely a, like a kid friendly movie. But again, that's not going to, I, I highly doubt you see Zachary Levi, you know, come back as, uh, Shazam ever again. And now they're, now, you know, like, what Gal Gadot's talking about how she and James Gunn are talking about a Wonder Woman three. I'm like, like at this point, if you're just, if you're yeah. if you're recasting over half the Justice League, just recast the ball. Well, he said that he said on Twitter that they wouldn't have actors playing other characters in the same universe. That this was a reboot. It's like decide if it's a reboot or not. Like I know they tell you know the Snyderverse to move on constantly, but it's like we'll tell that to fucking James Gunn. Quit using Gal Gadot and and Jason Momoa and all these characters that you assume. He's going to keep using it's like just do your own fucking thing. Like I mean, we're we're looking at like this is like the cinematic version of the new fifty two, and now we're right. you know like 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 behind the scenes, like not knowing what's what counts and what doesn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and now it's you know uh, you know we're right. expected to like hold on like the like Superman legacy is going to be the start of like DCU rebirth, which those comics were good and they kind of gr- gave a little bit more clarity, but like. I mean, Superman Legacy is two years away from happening if, like, the strike ends this year, and then uh, we'll 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 see. But at this point, like, there's already been a third round of reshoots for Aqu- for the se- for uh, Aquaman <laughs> two. Yep. So, like, I had a you know my friend Jeffrey, who is a, a big Batman fan, that I talked about. He he asked me the other day, like, if I wanted to go see uh, Blue Beetle. I'm like, man, I don't even know if I want to spend a free pass on it. Like, I know Zack Snyder's, <laughs> you know, for it, but like, I just can't. I don't know that I could be hurt by DC any more than I have anymore at this point. Like, I, I, I'll wait for it to be streaming. Like, I don't even want to spend a free ticket on it because I have that little faith in DC, and I'm DC through and through. And I've just, I've, just, I've been hurt too many times. I don't know if I'm ready to be hurt again so soon after the Flash. Yeah, well, you're and no, and and knowing <laughs> how bad that Aquaman two is going to be terrible. Welcome to near my state of mind with DC right now, yeah. except I'm like, DC has been dead. Like, let's try to revive it <laughs> is where I'm at right now. 